Oops, oh. I pushed the button. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was like, oh, <laughs> pushed the button. Hi, everybody. <laughs> welcome, welcome to Friday Author oh. Reads. Uh, yes, I'm here with Keith. Uh, is it now? I'm, I hope I say it right. Is it DeCandido? Nope. Nope. It's DeCandido. DeCandido. Okay. Yes. Uh, Don't okay. worry. Everybody gets that wrong. <laughs> well, that's why. That's why I had to make my you know good faith effort, right? So uh, I shall. I think uh, I shall just allow you to go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Tell us who you are and about what you write and where you're from. Give us the basic details here. Uh, well, I was, uh, I'm a writer, obviously. Um, I've been writing professionally for 30 years now um, uh, and writing fiction uh, professionally since 1994. So for about 26 years. Um, I started out doing nonfiction uh, writing book reviews and news articles and articles for for magazines and stuff like that. Um, I still do that. I still write uh, nonfiction quite a bit, uh, writing uh, articles about pop culture. But uh, as a fiction author, I have been writing science fiction, fantasy, horror, uh, comic book related stuff, comic books also, um, in various and sundry genres, including a large number of media tie-in books. So I've written in about in well over 30 different licensed universes from Star Trek to Supernatural to Alien to World of Warcraft. Can you uh, quick define for me what media tie-in book means? Uh, basically a book based on uh, something from another medium, uh, usually a TV show or a movie or a comic book or a game. So like a Dungeons and Dragons novel or a Star Trek novel okay. or a Star Wars novel. Or a Farscape comic yes, book. Yes, like the or, kind of the extended universe uh, yeah, outside of the yeah. movies or whatever. Yes. Okay. Now. Uh, and I've also written. Now, now that I've um, got that clear. <laughs> yes, I, and I've also written my own original work, one of which I will be reading shortly. Um, the uh, one of the biggest series I have is a fantasy police procedural series, which started with Dragon Precinct, and I also have a couple of urban fantasy series. Uh, one taking place in Key West, involving a woman named Cassie Zukov, and the one I'm going to be reading shortly, which is takes place in New York City which is about a guy named Brom Gold, who is a supernatural hunter for hire. This, These all sound amazing. And I will confess, I bought the first two, or at least what I think are the first two. I just sort of bought them in order of the precinct ones, because when I first saw them, I was really, I was really excited. I was like, oh, these look so neat and I want to read them. And so then a, a, a couple of days ago, I bought them. I was hoping I could get them in time to have them for the show, but alas, I was, I, I was about one day off on, on the ah. update for that. <laughs> so, yeah. boo, hiss. But I should be getting them soon, and that is very exciting. Okay. Uh, so I, I was so excited to have you introduce yourself to everybody. I did forget my obligatory, uh, hi, I'm your host, Fairy Princess Lolly, everybody. Please hit <laughs> the like and subscribe and ring the bell, this, this little thing right here, um, so that you can get notifications, and thank you. Also, if you are joining our show for the first time, or even not the first time, please remember that we are super happy to take questions in the comment section. And once Keith gets to reading here, then as you guys comment with your questions, I will write them down and then he will answer them after the show. And after our show today, he will be live on Discord to talk to you guys. So uh, that information is also in the low bar as well. We have a link to our server and soon I will have the information going across the screen for which which server and which room to go to. So uh, now that that is all out of the way um, and, and maybe just a little bit, uh, can you give us a little bit of information of like the synopsis about what it is you're going to read to us today before we launch into it? Um, the book is called A Furnace Sealed. This is the book. Um, it was published in 2019 by Wordfire Press. Uh, it is book one of the adventures of Brom Gold. Uh, I am working on book two right now, which tentatively has the title of Feet of Clay. Feet spelled F-E-A-T. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, that's not 100% definite yet, but it is. It, uh, I am working on book two and hoping to have it out either by the end of this year or the beginning of next year from Wordfire. Um... Brom Gold is a courser uh, who is a supernatural hunter for hire, uh, living and working in the Bronx, New York, which is where I'm from. Um, they say write what you know, and um, uh, 
basically, this is a world in which uh, supernatural creatures do exist. Most of them are just, you know, people. Um, some of them do cause trouble, in which case somebody like Brahm is hired. You know, if you need somebody to wrangle your unicorn or to uh, <laughs> watch, watch over the werewolves uh, on the night of the full moon so that they don't go around eating people's flowers and stuff. Um, but one of the opening... One of the opening scenes of the book has him taking basically all the local, the four local werewolves, bringing them to a dog run. So when the moon comes out, they can just run around the dog run and do what they need to do, and then and then bring them back home. Um, there are also vampires, and there's other various and sundry creatures. Uh, there is a wardeen, which is the person who is in charge of regulating all magical activity within a particular region. The wardeen of the Bronx is a woman named Miriam Zarelli. Um, and to set up the scene I'm about to read, one of the things things that happens locally in the Bronx is a bunch of coursers get together at a bar uh, on Katona Avenue in the Bronx and just have a drink up every Sunday night and just gossip and compare notes and stuff like that. Um, the chapter prior to the one I'm going to read was that week's drink up. Uh, recently, an immortal was found dead, which is very unusual because immortals aren't supposed to die. That's what immortal means. But... Um, <laughs> And it looks like a vampire killed the immortal. The thing is, in this world, vampires are kind of weenies. Um, they're, they're Yes, they're long-lived, and yes, they heal, but they're also very weak. They, they don't like to go out into the sun, and they're sickly, and you can probably take them in a fight. So, but there's, but, so one courser, who's a particularly obnoxious one, thinks that a vampire did it, and he's going to go after vamps, because vamps killed his parents. He mentions this a lot. Um... <laughs> And so that's that's the background, and um, so that that sets that up. So without unless, unless there's anything else, I can start reading chapter seven of A Furnace Seal. Yeah, that, that okay? actually, yeah, that sounds asking? great. Okay. Uh, no, not at least not at this point, but there will be, I'm sure, by the time you are done. So allow me yes. to turn the screen over to you here. Okay. Look, there I you go. Okay. Uh, I, I was, so this, these books are set though in a real play. So they're based on your real life surroundings though. More or less. Yeah. The, the, That's it was actually cool. inspired by 10 years ago. I worked for the U S census bureau and I worked here in the Bronx, uh, enumerating stuff, uh, here. And I got to explore lots of different parts of the borough that I had never been to, even though I've lived here most of my life. Um, you know, I was born here, raised here, educated here. And, um, and aside, and basically, forty of the fifty years I've lived on this earth, I've lived in the Bronx, and um, uh, that—that's part of what inspired me to do. Because when people write about New York City, they almost always write about Manhattan, south of 125th Street. Um, the rest of the New York City is very rarely mentioned, and if it, and if they do mention it, it's usually Brooklyn. So yeah. this is sort of my attempt to to address the rest of New York, or at least the part that I'm <laughs> most familiar with by by dealing with with the Bronx. Um, so yes, it does take place in the actual Bronx, <laughs> and, and the locations okay. you're going to mention here in the book are pretty much all real ones, one way or another. So without further ado, here is Chapter 7 of A Furnace Sealed. The nice thing about beer is that you can drink a ton of it, get a nice buzz on, but the next morning, you're not hungover. I've been pretty lucky. I've only been hungover three times, and they were all in med school. Safety tip for civilians, never go drinking with med students. Your liver will never be the same again. I needed to operate a Jagunda motor vehicle Monday morning, so it was for the best that the only thing I woke up with were some sore ribs, the gift that kept on giving from the Cloister's unicorn. I popped a bunch of painkillers and walked down the hill to the parking garage. It wasn't until I was halfway down the hill when I realized I was starting to get sweaty. It was too warm for the denim jacket. One of these days, I'd remember to check the weather on my phone before I went outside. Removing the jacket and tying it around my waist, which looked dorky but got the stupid thing out of my way without baking me, I arrived at the lot and got the moving van, the truck, out of hock, and then drove it the block and a half to the truck rental place. My water bottle was still in the cup holder, the water itself nice and warm and undrinkable after being baked in the truck for three days. The clerk who looked over the truck was an African-American woman named Darcel. As she climbed into the driver's seat to check the mileage, she said, Paperwork says you were bringing this back Saturday. Yeah, I kind of lost track of time on Saturday after, until after you guys closed. Okay, but 
you can just drop off the truck even after we're closed and then just enter the rental agreement number on our app. Or you could leave a message on the 800 number and we'd mail you the paperwork. She pointed at the sign in the window that provided that very information to anyone smart enough to read it. In other words, people other than me. Would have saved you two days of pay. I blinked. Really? Then what do you want from me? I don't rent trucks that often. She opened the back and then coughed. Damn! She said, making the word about six syllables. After a moment, I got it too. The remnants of a Hanjan's charm. Mind you, it only smelled about a tenth as bad as it did on Friday night, and it still stunk like rancid Limburger that had been left under a magnifying glass in sunlight. Yeah, sorry about that, I said. I didn't volunteer an explanation, mostly because I couldn't think of one that she'd believe. Look, based on the mileage, you didn't hardly drive the thing. I can take yesterday off, so you only get one extra day instead of two, all right? Thank you. I meant it, too, especially since I couldn't bill either extra day to the client. Once we took care of everything and I paid the bill, I headed over to the bus stop on 231st to get back up the hill to my house. According to my phone, the next BX7 would arrive in 15 minutes, so I occupied myself during the wait by trying to figure out what to do. On the one hand, Miriam needed to be told that Bernie Ataralde and possibly some other coursers were going after vampires. On the other hand, if the other coursers started thinking that I would run to the Wardeen every time someone did something that could be construed as hinky, they'd never say anything around me. Normally, when I had some kind of issue with the business, I'd either talk to Miriam or to Huge, the guy who trained me. But that wouldn't really work here. By the time the bus arrived and took me up the hill and I walked home, I wasn't any closer to a decision. So when I got inside, I called my rabbi. Aunt Esther answered on the second ring. What's wrong, Bram? What, I can't call my favorite aunt unless something's wrong? First of all, I'm only a favorite aunt when something's wrong. Second of all, you only call when something's wrong. If you want to just chat, you usually do it over email or text. So obviously, something's wrong. I sighed. <sighs> Fine, I do have a problem. I outlined the basics of what went down at the Kingfisher's Tale last night, focusing on Itteraldi's posturing, as well as McAnally and Antonelli sort of kind of go going along with it. Thing is, after I finished, they were also dismissing Miriam. What do you mean? Esther asked. I bit my lip. Just what I said. Saying she doesn't know her ass from her elbow, that kind of stuff. I mean, I get it. She drives down the median age of Wardeen's all by her lonesome, but that doesn't mean she isn't good at, a, at a, the job. All right, Bram, now you've told me the situation. What's the actual problem? Should I tell Miriam about what Itteralde and the others said? There was a several second pause. For this, you called me? I blinked. Ann Esther, don't Ann Esther me, you putz. Stop wasting time with me on the phone and call Miriam. So you think I should tell her? Yes, I think you should tell her. What I want to know is why you think you shouldn't tell her. Because if I go to Miriam every time a courser gets hinky, I'll be a responsible courser and be a good friend to Miriam. And if those doofuses don't appreciate that, then they're bad courses. And you don't deserve your friendship or your consideration. And from the sounds of it, they're being dumbasses. Isn't the warden's job to rein in dumbassery on the part of the courses? One part of the job, yeah, I chuckled. Thanks, Aunt Esther. I guess I just needed some encouragement. No, you needed a kick in the tuchus. Now, unless you want a real kick in the tuchus, you'll get that tuchus over to Miriam's place with an everything bagel, slathered in cream cheese and locks, and tell her what's going on. Now I laughed out loud. Of course, Esther remembered how Miriam liked her bagels. And of course, recommended I bring food. Yes, she was a rabbi, and an aunt, and a yenta. But first and foremost... She was a Jewish mother. I will. I will. Smart boy. Anything else or can I go back to my New York Times? It's almost noon. You haven't finished the Times yet? The first person to call me with a stupid problem, you aren't. I've been trying to read the same article for two hours. So if we're done, we're done. Thanks again, Aunt Esther. Next, I texted Miriam, who texted back that she was home. I paused long enough to give my cat mittens some desperately needed scritches. I'd say it was even money who needed them more, him or me. 
in addition to more food and water, and then headed out to Seward Place via the bagel shop. When I arrived at her house, I got to make it further than the foyer this time. Walking past the staircase, which was now outfitted with a chairlift for those rare occasions when Miriam used the house's second floor, I entered the living room to find her sitting at the computer desk reading over something. Hey Mimi, as promised, I have bagels. I set the bag and my coffee down on the glass table in front of the sofa. Miriam just grunted, which meant I'd need to wait until she was finished reading before she'd even properly acknowledge my presence. An immersive reader was Miriam. Finally, she finished and wheeled herself over to the coffee table. By that point, I was already halfway through my poppy seed bagel, which I ate with nothing on it, while Miriam's everything bagel was sitting on the flattened paper bag. Oh God, I need this bagel. She took a bite with her eyes closed and made nami noises before putting it back down and then sipping the mug of tea that was in her wheelchair's cup holder. That hits the spot. Thanks, Brom. Least I could do after screwing up the werewolves. Yes, this is the absolute least you could do, she said with a nod. For starters, you couldn't even be bothered to get a plate. So I could add to your dirty dish pile? No chance. Miriam glared at me. It's a pain to load the dishwasher. And what was your excuse when you let the dirty dishes take over the kitchen before the accident? Now she grinned. Oh, pure laziness. I just have a better excuse now. I chuckled and sipped my coffee. So you said you wanted to know what we gossiped about at the Kingfisher last night. Uh-oh. Frowning, I asked, what do you mean, uh-oh? The last time you actually told me what happened at the Kingfisher, it was Iteralde gloating about Castle Hill. And I had to sanction him and listen to his abusive voicemails and read his abusive emails for the entire month he was sanctioned. I sighed. Well, your instincts aren't bad. And it's even about Iteralde and vampires again. Before I could tell the story for the second time in an hour, Miriam's phone chirped with a generic ringtone. Even as it did, mine vibrated. I had turned the volume off when I was in the bagel shop. Miriam frowned at the display, then answered it. This is Wardine Zarelli. Obviously, it was someone in the game. I pulled my smartphone out of my pocket and saw that I had two text messages. Before I could look at them, Miriam said, Wonderful, that's all we need. What's the address? Okay, I'll be there as soon as I can. She put the phone down. Can you give me a lift to Shakespeare Avenue? Uh, I guess so. Why? A courser killed a vampire. Suddenly, I had a gut feeling that those two texts were from fellow coursers. Who? Iteralde? She shook her head. No. Eddie Mopatra. I nearly dropped my phone. I did drop my jaw. Eddie? Miriam sounded as confused as I felt. He's the one who called. Reported it right away. Staring down at my phone, I activated it. The two text messages were from fellow coursers. One from Iteralde the other from McAnally. That didn't bode well, since the two of them were at the top of the Vampire Hit Brigade. Iteralde always texted in all caps with minimal, with minimal punctuation. Hey, Gold, you gotta go talk to Zarelli because Mo Patra killed a vamp, and I don't want her coming down on him. Not fair. McAnally was a bit more coherent. Edward killed a vampire on Shakespeare Avenue. He called right away, right away and I advised him to report to the war dean. I thought you should know, since you were the one who put this together. I didn't put anything together, but if that's what McAnally believed, fine. I also noticed that Eddie left out that he called McAnally before he called Miriam, but I figured it wasn't necessary for her to know that. In fact, it was probably better that Miriam thought Eddie was more responsible. I dashed out the door to walk to my house to retrieve my car. By the time I returned to Seward Place with the Corolla, Miriam's wheelchair was at the edge of the driveway. I made a three-point turn, helped her into the car, folded the wheelchair, and put it in the trunk, got back in, and drove off. I'd given Miriam enough lifts since the accident that I could do the get her into the car, get her into the front seat and fold and put away the wheelchair routine in my sleep. In fact, once I pretty much did when she needed me to take her somewhere at three in the morning. Unlike me, Miriam had an account with several local car services, but for trips to places involving things like dead vampires, she preferred to keep as many civilians out of it as possible. As I drove down the Major Deegan Expressway through mild midday traffic, Miriam was fondling her smartphone. The address we're going to is an abandoned building right next to the Cross Bronx, but it's on the same block as a church and a post office, so I don't know how long we'll be able to keep it under wraps. But I thought I recognized the address. It's 1542 Shakespeare, and that's had a nest of vampires squatting in it for a few years now. I nodded. 
Eddie may have known that too and went there looking for trouble. Except that didn't make any sense. Eddie never looked for trouble. Also, Miriam added, if you say one word about how awful the Cross Bronx is or how awful Robert Moses was for building it or how many neighborhoods were bisected by it or how, many tra how much traffic is on it or any other damn thing, I will beat you with a stick. Putting my right hand over my chest while steering with my left, I said in a mock outraged tone, I have no idea what you're talking about, Mimi. What makes you think I'd go on about how a power-hungry city planner destroyed half the Central Bronx with a stupid expressway whose sole purpose is to get people through the Bronx and out of it with no regard for the people in it? You're in serious trouble as soon as I find a stick, boy chick. I should never have lent you that book. I chuckled. Miriam had lent me a copy of a book about Moses, the city planner who was responsible for a lot of the asphalt silly straws that made up the expressways of New York City. It took about 20 minutes to get to the address, and I spent it telling Miriam about what was discussed at the Kingfisher's Tale. So Eddie wasn't even there for the conversation about vampires? I shook my head. But Eddie's always been pretty plugged into things. He could have found out on his own. Yeah. I pulled in front of the rickety, boarded-up brownstone on Shakespeare Avenue between Featherbed Lane and the Cross Bronx Expressway Service Road. It was between another similar brownstone that looked occupied, and a small parking lot that, according to the sign, was used by the church that was a couple of doors down. The brownstone itself had a bedraggled white wooden fence next to the stoop, a pile of garbage cans on the other side of it. Usually, a brownstone in New York City evokes images of Manhattan's Upper West Side and Brooklyn's Park Slope, magnificent pieces of architecture that were built in the 19th century. This place, though, had none of the charm you saw in those more famous structures. It was just a boxy brown brick building. Three coursers were all on the stoop. Iteralde, looking pissed. McAnally, looking worried. And Eddie, looking resigned. The first two were sitting down, while Eddie was standing. But since Eddie was only 5'4", and the other two were freakishly tall, they all looked like they were the same height. Eddie was wearing a plain t-shirt and jeans. McAnally was, as always, in a nice button-down shirt, sleeves rolled up, and slacks, while Iteralde was still wearing that damn trench coat of his over a turtleneck, even though he had to be roasting. I double-parked, got out, pulled out Miriam's wheelchair, and helped her into it. Eddie had stepped forward right when we pulled up, but he was nice enough to wait until she was settled in her chair before approaching all the way. Bowing his head, he said, Ordin Zarelli? Miriam nodded. Eddie, how are Indira and Martin? The baby's running a fever, unfortunately. Iteralde rolled his eyes and got up from the stoop. Oh, for fuck's sake! Gazing past Eddie, Miriam stared at Iteralde. Is something wrong, Bernie? Look, I just want to make sure that Eddie doesn't get railroaded here. This was a good kill. And I'm just supposed to take your word for it, Miriam asked in her mock sweet voice which always scared the shit out of me. Iteralde, though, wasn't bright enough to be scared. You should. I actually know about vamps. Ever since my parents, even McAnally, rolled his eyes. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, to bring up your parents at a time like this. Before Iteralde could turn to yell at McAnally, Miriam said, Actually, Bernie, your parents were killed by Jiang Shi. Yes, they're similar to vampires in some respects, but they're not the same thing. The point is, something happened here, and you're standing around asking about his wife and kids, for fuck's sake. I shook my head. It's called being polite, Bernie. You should try it sometime. He ignored me and stared daggers at Miriam. Do you even know what you're supposed to be doing here, Miriam? Oh, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing here, Bernie. What I'm confused about is what you're doing here. Did you kill the vampire? No, I, but because when I got a call that a courser killed a vampire, my immediate thought was, what did Bernie do this time? Most of the vampire deaths in my domain since I became Wardeen have been at your hands. So if you didn't kill this one, why are you here exactly? Moral support. Me and Johnny, we want to make sure Eddie's okay and you don't treat this like you did Castle Hill. Fine. Go be morally supportive and quiet over there. She pointed at the stoop. Eddie, let's go for a walk. She and Eddie started moving slowly toward the Cross Bronx service road. Not too many pedestrians, especially on a Monday afternoon, and the traffic noise from the expressway gave them a certain amount of privacy. Once they were out of earshot, Iteralde looked at me urgently. 
You talk to her in the car? I regarded him with annoyance. No, we used semaphore the whole time. Of course I talked to her in the car. So when he'll be okay. How the hell should I know? Come on, you actually like her for some reason. You got to know how she's going to think. I sure as shit don't. She ain't nothing like her old man. Now that was a war dean. Zarelli knew what the fuck he was about. After Castle Hill, I cut him off sharply. Hang on, Bernie. She did the right thing after Castle Hill. In fact, if anything, she went easy on you. Remember when you went over her head to the Curia? All you did was make your sanction last another two weeks. Itteralde held up both hands. Hey, look, this isn't about me. It's about Eddie. He's got a wife and kid to support. He can't afford to get sanctioned, all right? Funny how when Miriam brings up Indira and the baby, it's proof that she's a lousy war dean. But when you bring it up, you're being a good friend. I am his friend. She ain't. No, she's the war dean. If he didn't do anything wrong, he'll be fine. Ain't nothing wrong about killing a vamp. McAnally finally spoke up. He'd been glancing up the block at Miriam and Eddie talking at the corner. From what Edward told me, it was self-defense. What the hell was he doing here, anyhow? I asked. Indicating the abandoned brownstone with his head, Itteraldi said, This shithole's been a vamp squat for a while now. McAnally added, Edward wanted to question one of the vampires he's used as an informant with regard to the immortals who were killed. He attacked, and Edward was forced to defend himself. Where's the body? Again, Interalde shook his head toward the brownstone. Still in there. Ain't like it's going to make the place smell worse. Ain't like it's the first corpse in there, neither. Miriam and Eddie started heading back toward us. She took a glance at the dozen or so stairs that led to the brownstone's front door, then shook her head. I'm just going to take Eddie's word for it that Figueroa is alone in there and dead. I assumed Figueroa was the vampire. I can verify that if you wish, Mr. Ellie, McAnally said. When I arrived, the vampire was lying dead in the building's vestibule. His neck was snapped. Nodding, Miriam said, thank you, John. I appreciate that. And that matches what Eddie just told me. I was impressed. Snapping a person's neck isn't as easy as it looks on television. And Eddie wasn't the most impressive physical specimen in the world. Then again, I'd never actually seen him in a scrap. I only knew his rep and his drinking habits on Sunday nights. Because of Eddie's history, I'm willing to believe that it was self-defense. Gee, how nice, Itteraldi muttered. I winced. I could tell that Miriam heard him, but chose to pretend she hadn't. She went on. However, Eddie also was acting on his own, without a client or a particular cause. He wasn't charged with investigating the deaths of Warren Mather and Ben Palmer, but their deaths were what prompted him to question Alvaro Figueroa, who then attacked him unprovoked. He was scared, Eddie said quietly. I nodded. Probably worried that some nut job would use this as an excuse to hunt vamps. I was staring right at Itteralde when I said that. That, Miriam said, is not happening. I'm not sanctioning Eddie, though I am putting him on restriction for the time being. Any existing contracts may be fulfilled, and he can still purchase mag magical items as needed, but, but no new contracts until this matter is settled. I understand, Wardeen, Eddie said with a bow of his head. Thank you. You're thanking her? Interalde threw up his hands. You're taking food out of his mouth, lady, and his kids. Until we know for sure what happened to the immortals, I'm not taking any chances. P people going off half-baked information will just result in more people getting killed beyond Figueroa. Who gives a fuck? He's a vamp. McAnally put a hand on Interalde's shoulder. That's enough, Bernabe. It ain't even close to enough. Vamps killed those people, and we gotta do nothing, Miriam said sharply. Let me be abundantly clear, Bernie. Vampires are off limits until we know for sure what happened to Mather and Palmer. We know what happened, Itteralde shouted. Her tone getting quieter, even as Itteralde's grew louder, Miriam said, no, Bernie, we don't. We know what it looks like, but we also know how bad vampires are at violence, and we know how hard immortals are to kill. There's still too many unknowns here, and just jumping to conclusions has already resulted in one death, and I'm not going to let people go off half-cocked killing anyone. As of right now, Vampires are off-limits to all coursers in this domain. If a contract comes up, comes up that involves interaction with a vampire, the courser will have to run it by me before make, taking the contract. Or, in the course of a contract, a, vamp, a courser must approach a vampire. That, too, must be run by me first. Anyone who violates these instructions will automatically be sanctioned for a year. Oh, for fuck's sake. Seriously? Miriam glanced up at Itteralde. One more comment, Bernie, and I'll sanction you just for the hell of it. Now, if you'll just shut up for a second, we need to get Figueroa's body taken care of. Bernie, John, I'm officially hiring you for that job. 
dispose of the body before someone from that church down the street notices the smell when they park their car. Excuse me, Miss Zarelli, McAnally said, but you just informed us that we may not approach vampires. Living ones, Miriam smiled. Dead ones are fine. Etiraldi suddenly looked outraged. Based on the look on his face, I think he realized that Miriam could have been setting him up to sanction him for approaching Figueroa's body without asking her permission first. But Miriam wasn't that devious or vindictive, though I wouldn't blame her for doing it to Etiraldi just on principle. And besides, she wouldn't have included McAnally in the job if she just wanted to nail it to Ralde. Eddie, she said, go home. Take care of Martine. I'll let you know when I can lift the restriction. Again, Wardeen, thank you. And I'm sorry. Eddie reached out his hand, and Miriam returned the handshake. Without another word, Eddie got into his car, which was parked across the street, and drove away. I'll leave you to it, gentlemen, Miriam said. Send me the bill when it's done. Brom? I nodded, and we headed back to my car. I got her into the passenger seat and put the chair in the trunk. The whole time, Itteralde was giving both of us the hairy eyeball, until McAnally said, Come, Bernabe, let us do our appointed task. Yeah, whatever. They went up the stoop stairs, Itteralde's stupid coat swooshing behind him, and I drove us down Shakespeare to Featherbed. As soon as I made the left turn onto Featherbed, which was a funny half-oval shape, probably left over from when it was a road used by farmers in colonial times. Miriam said, Brom, I need you to find out who's killing these immortals. I hereby give you permission to approach any vampires you might need to in order to solve this. Okay. I wasn't entirely surprised at this, but I was a little nervous about it too. You sure you want me to handle this? You were the one who found Warren, and you're the one I sent to check on Palmer, so it makes sense to keep you on it. Besides, I trust you to actually listen to me. As I winced as I turned right under University Avenue. Look, Bernie is Bernie. He wasn't like this when Dad was alive. You know how Eddie was, all polite and deferential and stuff? Eddie's like that with everyone. Right, well, that's how Bernie was with Dad. I blinked. Really? Bernie? Really. He didn't turn into an asshole until Dad died. <sighs> then again, half the courses in the domain turned into assholes then. Shrugging as I pulled into the queue of cars waiting to go left onto Burnside Avenue... I said, I don't know about that. I do. I'm only 30 years old, I'm in a wheelchair, and I have a uterus. Most of these jerks could probably deal with one of those, maybe two, but all three? I can't walk, so I don't know what it's like to be in the field. I'm too young, I don't really know anything, and this is men's work, not women's work. I didn't roll my, my eyes because I was keeping a close look on the oncoming traffic, waiting for a break so I could turn left onto Burnside. Oh, come on, the best coursers I know are women because they have to bust their ass twice as hard to be considered half as good. Honestly, there's a reason why I try to give Abby and Dahlia and Siobhan and Trina as much work as I can. I only gave that body disposal to John and Bernie because of time is of the essence, and they were there anyhow. We can't leave a vamp body just lying around. I finally was able to make the left turn, and I maneuvered around the double-parked cars on Burnside. Speaking of jobs, though, I think the first thing I should do is find Anne Delancey. Good idea. I still haven't found Dad's file on her. Of course, what I really would like to know is who that woman was who gave you Delancey's name. You and me both. I drove down the steep hill of 179th Street that took us down to the entrance to the Major Deacon. You and me both. That is Chapter 7 of A Furnace Sealed, which is available from Wordfire Press. Uh, it's available in trade paperback, hardcover, and ebook, as well as audiobook. The audiobook is read by T.J. Clark. Uh, who does a brilliant job, by the way. It, um, if you enjoyed my reading, you'll enjoy TJ's even more. He just nailed it. Absolutely. Um, so any of those. And again, I am working currently on the sequel, uh, which I hope to have out like by the end of this year, beginning of next year. There's also going to be a story set in the same setting uh, with a different course there, a woman named Yolanda Rodriguez, which is going to be in an anthology called Badass Moms, which is going to be out on Crazy 8 Press uh, in July. It's edited by Mary Fan, and it's, it's a wonderful anthology. Uh, and so you can, um, I, I strongly recommend picking that up. Yolanda is going to be appearing in Feet of Clay also, so in the second book. So, well, thank you so much for doing that. I we do have a few questions for you if you are, okay, yes, if you're feeling froggy. All right, so the uh, the first question, and since you brought up who it was that read your on uh, this this book in audio. Uh, one of the questions from the audience was, 
have you thought about doing audiobooks because they liked your reading voice? Thank you. Um, I I don't have the equipment to do a professional audio reading. You know that would be of the quality that would be necessary for an audio book. Uh, and honestly, I don't have the time. Um, having said that, if you enjoy me reading my work, there is a YouTube channel uh, that I started up in March uh, called Crad COVID Readings. Uh, Crad being my initials, Keith already hands it out. COVID, obviously, uh, readings. Um, there's a link to it on my website at tokenzo.net. Uh, I have been doing, uh, I've read 32 of my stories. I've written close wow. to 100 short stories and uh, and I've been reading them on that channel. So if you if you enjoy this, uh, you will definitely want to check out um, the readings there. Uh, I have read both uh, a Brom Gold story that I wrote uh, back in 2011 called Under the King's Bridge uh, and also the Badass Mom story that I mentioned a few minutes ago, I read on that as well. Um, and... Um, so if you check that out, if you want to hear me reading other things, that's the place to go. Uh, feel free to subscribe to the channel. Uh, I've been doing three readings a week. I've been trying to upload one on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. In fact, one just went up uh, this afternoon, uh, one of my Dragon Precinct stories. So um, feel free to check that out. So And thank you. I, I, I enjoy reading. I like doing readings at conventions. Um, I actually started doing the YouTube channel because conventions aren't really a thing right now. So... <laughs> Um, and I originally did it for one of the, on Facebook, there've been a couple of, uh, sort of virtual conventions that have been going on. One is called Consolation, like cancellation, yes. and another one called Continual. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, the first reading that I did, I did for Consolation and it sort of mutated from there. So. so I think, I think I have the information for that. I'm not sure if I do, but I think I do in the low bar because I definitely did check out your YouTube channel and gave you a subscribe yeah. as well. So yeah. I would recommend everybody rush over there after the show and hit the hit the subscribe and ring the bell button. I Did I get that right, though? I put it there in your little banner. Uh, it's, it's, two, it's two words. It's cred and then space COVID and oh. COVID's all caps also. But that that if you if you search for it, you should That's find it. Enough. There's also a link. Uh, on my website to it as well. So Okay. And the website is going down there. So yeah. now speaking of conventions, what uh, what are your conventions? Where do you go for these? Um the normal in a in a year in which there is not a pandemic, uh, I usually do like 20 <laughs> conventions a year. Um I there are some that I go to regularly on my own, um, including media conventions like Farpoint and Shore Leave. Uh, literary conventions like Heliosphere and Balticon uh, and Capclave. Um, I go and I go to DragonCon every year. I go to New York Comic Con most every year. Oh wow! Um, and then also, uh, I'm part of a group of authors that goes to a bunch of different media conventions with an organization called Bard's Tower. Bard's Tower is run by Alexi Vandenberg, and what he does is it's sort of a traveling bookstore. Uh, in a way, yes. Or, or, uh, well, tra a traveling author show. Uh, basically, he brings authors to comic conventions and media conventions and stuff like that, uh, giving people an opportunity to sell their books and sign their books and interact with their readers. Um, and I've done a lot. I've been doing that for the last uh, two, three years. And hopefully, you know, once the apocalypse is over, we'll go back to doing it again. Um, but uh, so I do some with 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 them as well. Um, so you you're all all around in there. So oh, I'm sorry. I'm most sorry you're ones, missing your cons. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I miss the, I miss it a lot. I miss I, I like interacting with people, and and uh, I'm an extrovert, and this sort of thing is. You know, I mean, I work from home, so my work life is very much the same as it's always been. Uh, but I I miss people. <laughs> oh, and I'm I also so miss sorry. I, uh, I I I in addition to writing, I'm also a martial artist, um, and I'm still able to take karate classes because we're doing them virtually over Zoom. But, oh, that's cool. but I also teach an after school program, which hasn't been a thing since March um, and probably won't be for a while now. And I, I really miss that. I miss my kids and I miss teaching them. But soon, but, oh, soon. So we're, we're at least, well, you're in New York. And so I don't actually know. Yeah. I don't know what it's like over there in the Big Apple. Over here, things have started to reopen a little bit, albeit slower than expected because of many other things going on. But yeah. now a question that's kind of related to, uh, to, to what you were talking about with the conventions was mm -hmm. um, given how prolific you are, 
uh, knowing how prolific you are, how do you find the time to write so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is my job. Um, you know, I, the you have to make the time. Um, one of, one of the things I always hear from aspiring writers is, "I'd love to write, but I can't find the time." As if time is something that rolled under the couch. Um, the I, around here it might be. <laughs> yeah. um, it's you have to you have to make the time. You have to carve out the time to do it. You have to put your butt in the chair. You have to put your fingers on the keyboard and you have to just keep putting one word in front of the other. Um, it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. But um, you just got to force yourself to sit down and do it. And that's what I do. And, and like I said, it, it is what I do for a living. I mean, this is, this is, I don't have an office job. Uh, I haven't had one since 1998. Um, and uh, it's, it's, and I, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's self-discipline, which, which is hard. Um, yeah. but, uh, you gotta just, and, and one of the tricks is to allow yourself to not always be good at it. You know, I always say the first draft is allowed to suck. Um, and, and it's important to get words down. They don't have to be the best words. You can always go back and put in better words later. And a lot of the words are going to be the anyhow. So just get it down, get it, get the stuff done. The, the hardest part is to finish what you start. And that's the biggest step. If 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 you finish what you start, then you have a complete thing that you can then revise and make better. So, so speaking of discipline, and we we I just have a couple more questions from those who are watching, but I, I kind of have a question related to what you were talking about with it discipline. Because mm -hmm. as you know, uh, I too obviously am working from home as well. And I have had my own business for many years making handmade magical supplies and you know, branched out branched out into this realm a, you know, a couple of years ago. And it, so I agree with you that it is definitely a thing that requires a great amount of self-discipline because even if you still get to be in your pajamas, you still must get up and put your butt in, you know, in my case, on a tuffet, uh, you know, and, and do the work. And so I'm curious now, you mentioned martial arts. And so I'm curious, do you think that, do you think that the skills that you have learned there in your martial arts has extended to help you with with having that discipline in being a writer working from home or vice versa? Well, not really because I, I was working from home for quite some time before I started taking up martial arts. I, I, I became a full-time freelancer in May of 98. And I didn't start training uh, at the dojo until September of 2004. So what the, what's interesting to me though is that basically what happened in 2004 was I turned 35 and the warranty ran out on this. Um, I I I was suddenly beset with numerous health problems to which uh, my doctor said maybe you should try exercising you know once and um, <laughs> so because up to that point the only thing I really exercised was my futility um, and uh, I. You know, I sit in a chair and type all day. So it was very sedentary. Sedentary, life. yeah. <laughs> uh, and one of the reasons why I joined a martial arts dojo in particular, uh, as opposed to, say, joining a gym or something like that, is that there are scheduled classes because all of my self-discipline is tied up in my writing. If if I joined a gym, first of all, it would bore the crap out of me because I hate the stuff you do in gyms, whereas martial arts actually engages me mentally. But yes. leaving that aside, having scheduled classes really made a difference because it's like, okay, I have to go to the class because the class is at eight o'clock, so I have to go now. Because if it was just for me, like at a gym where you just go whenever you feel like it, I'd never go. Um, because, so in, in that sense, it sort of helped in that regard. And also there, there's other things that it has helped with just in terms of, of mental discipline and not letting things get to me and keeping calm and, and keeping centered in a lot of ways, particularly when things get stressful as they do often. Um, honestly, th this whole situation uh, with, with the coronavirus would be even more unbearable than it was if I didn't have karate classes two days a week. And I'm doing it in my living room, but um, you know, with Better than not at all. Classes on my screen. But uh, so, uh, so one of the other questions that we have here from the audience, let me 
I have to scroll up here a little bit to find it. Okay. okay. Given your experience with writing novels in well-known settings, do you find it more rewarding to build your own world and story setting? It is neither more nor less rewarding. I mean, ultimately, the the what you're doing is basically is the same thing. You have to make a story. You have to make a story with a beginning and a middle and an end in which interesting things happen to people about whom you care. So that part of it is going to be the same no matter what. Um, the, the, the world building is less of an issue in a tie-in because the world's already been built for you before you get there. Um, but that doesn't, but you know, that's also true when I write like the fifth book in my precinct series, um, that I've pretty much done most of the world building there too. Um, I mean, stuff gets added all the time. Um, but, and, it, and that can be a challenge. And there are some that are not, that are fairly vague in what they've built. So you've still got room to play with it. Um, but it's, I mean, what, what you lose in not getting to be the guy, person who created it all, you gain in getting to write characters that you were a fan of. You know, I've gotten to put, I've gotten to write John Luke Picard. I've gotten to write Worf. I've gotten to write, you know, Sam and Dean Winchester. I've gotten to write um, Amanda Ripley. You know, I, I have. That's awesome. Yeah, these are all characters that I really enjoyed getting to contribute to the 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 oof of you know. Yes, the um, the lore surrounding them, if you will. Exactly. Yeah, I've I've, and in some cases I've gotten to like um, I did a Starcraft novel back in 2006, based on the, the game. Um, it was supposed to tie into a game that wound up never actually happening called uh, StarCraft Ghosts. But I got to develop some of the backstory for the main character of that game, a character named Nova, and they that got incorporated into the, into the lore of the game, which was cool. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Mm. Oh, here we have, um, is there, is, are there any influences that you, that you feel bleeding through as you write? Ah. Uh, Tons. I mean, I the the a lot of the people I grew up reading, I think, still influence me to some extent. Um, when when I first started reading things on my own as a kid, I read uh, Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea trilogy and uh, Robert Heinlein's YA books and J uh, the, the Hobbit by Tolkien and uh, and and also P.G. Woodhouse's Jeeves and Worcester uh, stories, which is pretty much me in a nutshell right there. Um, and I also read a lot of comic superhero comic books, particularly Marvel comics that were published between like around, around 1981, 82, 83, like when I when I started entering high school. Um, and that was that was a really particularly good era for for Marvel in particular. That was when Frank Miller was doing Daredevil and Walt Simonson was doing Thor, and guys like uh, Chris Claremont, Cliff Claremont was doing the X Men, uh, J.M. DeMattis and um, Roger Stern and uh, Tom DeFalco and Bill Mantlo and some other. Oh man, you're so good at remembering names. <laughs> um, these and all of those uh, guys had some influence on me to some extent or other. Um, so yeah, um, the the and 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 I'm still things are influencing me now as I as I read them and watch them and listen to them, you know. And like I said, A Furnace Sealed came out of working for the Census Bureau for for the better part of a year. Um, the the precinct novels, the two main characters in the precinct, uh, Dragon Precinct and its various novels and short stories and such, those two main characters are based on D and D characters that I played in my twenties. Um, I love that. Uh, I love the I love that you've done that. That that you have made their those characters stories and real in that way. Yeah, and and they're only partly. I mean, there, there's changes from what they were in the, in the RPG setting, but. Uh, but they're still the same basic characters that they were. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the other urban fantasy series that I do, which is a series set in Key West, that's based on visiting Key West, basically. I went to Key West for the first time in 1993, have been back many times since then, and what inspires those stories is the island and, and the stuff that happens on the island, and, and it's the perfect place to set urban fantasy stories. And I've written a lot of stories set there. Not just not just that urban fantasy series, but I did a supernatural novel set there. I wrote a Doctor Who short story set there. Um, wow. And I did a, a standalone story, um, excuse me, an alternate history story um, for an anthology back in 2016 that was set there as well. So, 
so that actually kind of what you just said sort of ties into one of the questions that I see here in the comments, which is, do you find inspiration for your characters amongst the people that you meet? Because obviously you do with the places, so find inspiration there. Oh, sure. So. sure, yeah, the, I, I, I like people and I like listening to people and talking to people and, and yeah. Um, I mean, in, in tie-in fiction, not as much because it's based on the actual characters that are on the screen or in the game or in the comic Already book. Already established, yeah. But, but for my own uh, fiction, uh, my original fiction, yeah, the, the, uh, all the characters are, are inspired to some extent by real people, at least to a degree. Um, well, there was a comment earlier as you were reading that your your reading your portrayal of the characters was very realistic to where they were set because, like you, they don't allow people to really finish sentences before they're interrupting them or cutting them off, and you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how we talk around here. <laughs> very, very fast. Yes. So. I'm constantly interrupting each other. Yes. Yes. My, so uh, Fairy Queen Mom lives up there in Maine and or what we call the Duchy of Snow. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is one of the things that I often lament about is how do you guys have conversations? Nobody even gets to finish a sentence. One person starts and before they're even done, the next person is already talking. How do you even know what they were going to say? It's, oh, it's maddening. <laughs> Yeah, so, I, mean, I grew up with it. It's the only way I know how to converse. But um Well, so and I and so I noticed also, and this is kind of just a a, a thing from me, and actually, oh, we're at 255. Okay. Maybe maybe I should cut to the okay. I had I had like a couple different questions, but one one of them was I believe that I saw that you have a Patreon. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. Yes. And what is your Patreon? Uh, the Patreon is basically supplies. It's it's an partly no, an I mean, LSD. The link. What's oh, the, the link? link? I'm sorry. Uh, it's patreon.com slash cred, K R A D, my initials. Very easy. Okay. Yeah. And so, so one of the things that I wanted to put out there, because Patreon is also one of the uh, good ways, very good ways to support uh, independent artists and authors, et cetera, et cetera. And so I wanted to just ask you really quick uh, if you could tell us a little bit about what your Patreon subscribers get at maybe a couple of the different levels that are some of the cool bonuses that they would get for subscribing to your Patreon? Uh, it's it's a fairly low-key one. Um, for $1 a month, you get regular movie reviews, um, usually about one a month or, or so. Uh, for $2 a month, you also get regular cat pictures. I have two very photogenic cats, um, and that's actually a very popular tier, not surprisingly. Um, for five dollars, you also get in addition to those two uh, regular TV reviews. Uh, I do more of those than I do the movie reviews. Uh, at seven dollars, you get also get uh, a weekly excerpt from my work from one of my works in progress, whatever I'm working on right now. There's a little oh, bit that's cool. from that. Uh, Ten dollars a month, and I'm behind on these. I got to catch up. I do a monthly vignette featuring one of my original characters, whether it's Brom Gold or the characters in the Precinct books. Cassie Zukov, the Key West one, and I have a couple of others. The Super City Cops, which is about cops in a city filled with superheroes, and also uh, Holmes and Watson pastiche characters that I have, uh, Shirley Holmes and Jack Watson, who are two people in modern-day New York who solve crimes. And I've done little little short vignettes, uh, one a month also, uh, of those. And what does then the also, word pastiche mean? I'm sorry? What does the word pastiche mean? Uh, basically, a, a, a version of Sherlock Holmes and John Watson. Okay. But, versions of them in 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 it, it's a young woman and an african-american medical student in modern new york um and gotcha. okay really, i understand yeah, yeah. I, then, I just was not familiar with that term and so uh that's for ten dollars a month you get all of that and then for 20 you additionally uh get a first look at my first dress so when i finish a first draft of a short story or a chapter in a novel you get to see it before everybody else does that is very cool and it's all i i kept it low-key and cheap <laughs> um, because I know that you know times are hard and also I don't have time to do anything more complicated with it um, so I'm trying to keep it within the means of what I can do and uh, it's been a fun I, the vignettes have been so much fun to do it gives me an a place to write about TV and movies 
other than the gig I have with tour.com where I've been writing about pop culture, but there's, they don't publish everything. Um, so it's, it's and so you can still get them out there. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and also everybody loves cat pictures. I, I confess, I love cat pictures. Uh, we had we had a cat visitor here because I I too am a cat person, and we've got some very photogenic cats around here. And uh, you had the whole screen though earlier, so nobody got to see uh, fluffy sister cat come through a couple of times. One, <laughs> one of mine is next to me here on the floor. <laughs> Look at that kitty. There we go. Oh, oh my goodness. Cat yeah. life is so that is, hard. That is Louie. How uh, do they manage? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it is it is 258. And so I want to uh, allow you to have some last words if you have them, but also to remind folks, hop on over to our Discord. And the link for that is actually in the low bar, should be in all the descriptions. That, and you're looking for the hedge and we're going to be in the 97 rock house channel and you're welcome to come for an author after talk and with that said and of course like and subscribe do those things please um is there anything else that you would like to say before we hop on over to discord um nothing specific just you know check me out you can the decandido.net is a spectacularly primitive website. It looks like it was created by somebody who learned HTML in 1996. That's because I learned HTML in 1996. Um, <laughs> but it's basically a linked up. It, it, it tells you how to get to all the places where I'm active online. So it links to my Facebook page, my blog, my Twitter feed, my Instagram account, my Wikipedia page, my YouTube channel, and um, uh, to my work it's on Twitter. Hub. So it's, it's, and also to, you know, my, my most links to buying for my most recent books and stuff like that. You can find my stuff online. People always ask me, what's the best way to buy your books that you'll get money? I don't care. Buy them wherever you want. Buy them from Amazon, buy them from Barnes and Noble, buy them from Kobo, buy them directly from me. I have some that I can send people. Just don't pirate them. That's all I ask. Um, so if they yeah. buy them directly from you though, then you can sign them. Yes. But only if I actually have copies of it, which I don't have of everything, but, um, but yes. Fair. All right. Well, then I, we shall say good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you for your questions. We love to have those. Yes. And we are going to... Question, too. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Very good. Uh, we are going to hop on over to Discord. So I, there may be people there already. If you are, just hang out for a minute. I do actually have to switch where I, my format where I'm sitting. So uh, I will be there in a minute. But uh, we shall see you. We shall talk to you very shortly. See you anon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes, I, I have pushed the button once and twice.